Hey guys, Pastor Tim here. Hope you're ready for another video from our youth group at Lighthouse Baptist Church. If this is your first time watching a video or you're trying to catch up on a missed lesson, we hope that this video is a blessing to you and helps you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Half expected somebody to just come jaunting through the door when I was praying there. but Alright, so 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So we're going to finish this chapter off, hopefully finish this chapter off today. We've just been finishing uh, the past couple of weeks talking about church discipline. What was the first thing in chapter 5? What was uh, the, the big problem, big sin that was uh, being known in the church of Corinth? Uh, yes. Uh, the people in the church were suing each other. That, that was last week. What about the week before? Yeah. Uh, fornication? The fornication, yes. The uh, man committing incest that was just being widely known and nothing was being done about so we had that in chapter five two weeks ago last week we we're talking about everyone that was apparently wanting to sue each other over all these uh matters in the church and not bringing their cases to the unbelievers or as the bible calls the unrighteous instead of following what we saw in matthew chapter 18 a biblical way to handle conflict so today we're going to finish off chapter six we're going to talk about protect the body Okay, and as we go through this passage here, you're going to see a lot of, I'm not going to say like double meaning, but obviously the church is often described, even in Corinthians, as the body of Christ. You're going to see this at the end of the, the chapter as well. But in our passage, it's going to talk a lot about fornication, okay? And that obviously is something that is done against the body as well. So there is both an individual application, but also a broader church application Okay, so as we go through it, we'll try to be mindful of both of those. All right, so let's, um, let's just read the first three verses of chapter 6. We're going to read verse 9 to 11. And the Bible says, Know ye not that the unrighteous, okay, the unbeliever, shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Duh. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind. Okay, so... For a second, just kind of compartmentalize that verse right there when he describes that list of sins. And then we go to the next list, verse 10. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners nor shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then verse 11, and such were some of you. So he's, he's reflecting on, hey, this is where you once were before you came to know Christ as your Savior. You were of the unrighteous. You were an unbeliever. You were one that was not to inherit the kingdom of God. But we're going to talk about it in a second. He has another meaning behind that as well to kind of hammer home how guilty they are as well about their sin they're not taking care of in the church, in the body. Verse 11, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So Paul refers to the unrighteous in this couple of verses here. All right, but if they were to look inwardly, the, the people in the church of Corinth would have recognized that they were guilty of these same things. Right? Remember, I told you to compartmentalize uh, verse 9. Okay, let's look at that again. It says, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. And what that can be categorized is those are sensual sins, sexual sins. Okay, you go back to chapter 5, the church of Corinth, there was a man that was guilty of fornication. As we're going to see in the rest of this chapter, there were some practices of fornication that were widely still practiced even amongst the believers in the church of Corinth. Okay, remember, church of Corinth, problems. That's the main thing to describe them. And then we look at verse 10, and it talks about this other list where it says, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of of God. This is referring to civil sins, meaning sins that are committed against one man against another, which kind of goes back to what we talked about last week at the beginning of chapter 6, where the church once again was guilty of 
suing one another over these civil matters, even quite trivial matters at that. So when he says those things, and if the Corinthians were looking on the inside and understanding, you know what, we're guilty of that as well, he hammers it home in verse 11 where he says, and such were some of you. So not just referring to what they were before they knew Christ as their Savior, part of the unrighteous, but it was also an indictment against them that they have been, been behaving no differently than the world that they should have been left behind. He says, but such were some of you. But their pride, remember they're very guilty of pride, their pride blinded them and they were not living up to their position in Christ. Okay, you guys follow me there? So this is, a, this is Paul is going to get to, this is an important reason to protect the body, not just your body, but also the body of Christ, because here's the church, the church of God, the church of Corinth, and they were guilty of all the same things that the people, the unrighteous, the unbelievers outside of the church were guilty of. And let it not be so named amongst any church of God. Uh, turn over to Ephesians chapter 4 real quick. <clears throat> all right, this is what is gonna, should describe how a believer or how the church should operate on a day-to-day -day basis, not what we see in the church of Corinth. So Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to read verse 1 through 6. It says, Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. The vocation, your, your duty as a Christian, walk worthy of that. With all lowliness of mind, or lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Complete opposite of what the church of Corinth was operating with right now. They definitely were not operating in lowliness and meekness. Endeavoring, definitely not love for one another because they're too worried about suing one another last week. All right, verse three, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. All right, if you guys are seeking just to sue your fellow brother or sister in Christ, are you keeping the unity in the bond of peace in the church? No, definitely not. There's one body and one spirit. This is very important because we're going to look at this at the end of the chapter. One body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Okay? We're going to get to uh, uh, the crux of that later in this lesson. But as a Christian, we are all one in Christ. That's important to understand. You individually, as a believer, you are one in Christ. Okay? And then also, as a body of believers in the church, the body of Christ, we are one in Christ. Although it all be one body, they're all different members, as the body's composed of different members, two hands, two feet, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. You guys know the song, all right? So it is in the body of Christ, okay? So back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, verse 11, it goes on where it says, It's such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified. What does sanctified mean, Ethan? Set apart from the world. Set apart unto Christ, or set apart for Christ. And ye are justified. What does justified mean? Joanna, to be made free. To be, that's good. Be made free, uh, declared righteous, made new. We talk about the new man. Uh, we also talk about in our Sunday school lessons how it's uh, regenerated. Okay, they're not living up to that position right now. They're not living a sanctified life. They're not living set apart for God. No, they're living just as the world is. They're not living as if they've been justified. And I'm glad that Joanna said set free because we're going to talk about that here in the next couple verses. Our first point is who is in control. When it comes to protecting the body, okay, whether it be your own or church, you need to ask yourself, who's in control? All right, we've been working on this in our Sunday School series as well. Uh, let's read verse 12 through 14. It says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Okay, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. All right, that's a important thing to remember there. Don't allow yourself to be brought under the power of any one thing. Verse 13, meats for the belly and the belly for meats. Amen. No, okay. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall... Guys, I just started to diet again with the, with the cayenne, and I'm hungry. So anyway, meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is, for, is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up us by his own power. So I want to focus for a second. The reason I have this point is who's in control. 
in verse 12 where it says at the very end, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And he talks about how like all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. So Paul speaks of our bodies, and it's important when he says this that we remember what he says at the end of this chapter. Look down at verse 20. Okay, this is the, the crux of this whole lesson today, protected by. Verse 20 says, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are whose? God's. That's, that's the most important thing to remember. Who's in control? Remember that verse. It's going to help you out greatly. See, upon salvation, when you were justified, declared righteous, or as Joanna said, what was it? Set free. Upon salvation, you were bought by Christ and set free from sin. We have not been set free, okay? When you look at the Church of Corinth, and when you look how Christians can operate even today, right? You were not set free from sin to become under bondage to sin again. Does that make sense? If somebody, if uh, back when uh, Abraham Lincoln put forth the Emancipation Proclamation and slaves were set free and, and they were actually set free, it would not make sense for them to turn around and be like, all right, just put me back in bonds again, right? That defeats the whole purpose, okay? But that's what people do spiritually when, as a believer, they have been set free from sin, yet they still choose to be put or brought under the power of sin. Remember, I will not be brought under the power of any. Let's look at a couple of phrases here. He says, all things are lawful unto me. Okay, he says that in verse um, 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Does anybody know what expedient means? Dex. Profitable. That's correct. It's not profitable. Wow, very good. Um, or helpful. Uh, all things are lawful in me. So historically, in the Church of Corinth, here's what he's referring to historically. All right? A lot of the temple worship back then, they would offer sacrifices and so forth, and they would then sell the leftover meat at like a discount price. You know, it's like they're going to Costco or something at the temple and getting this leftover meat. Now, there was debate in the church of whether or not the believers should even want to buy this meat that was once offered to idols. And Paul even writes about that in other books. Okay. And there was an understanding that it's just meat. And that is true. It's just meat. And Paul says like, there is even this debate of like, well, you know what? You may be able to handle that. No problem. But maybe another brother in Christ who may have just left idol worship. Um, that's a, that's a stumbling block for him. So it's something you have to be discerning about. Do I want to be a stumbling block to my brother or I do have the liberty in order to do this? But much more than that, when he talks about all things are offered to me, the belly, the meat for the belly and the belly for meats, is that a lot of the temple worship in Corinth, the secular temple worship, pagan temple worship, also involved, as we're going to see later in this chapter, uh, the employment of harlots. Okay, so it's not just that they might be eating meats that were once offered to idols, but they also had the temptation of when they went to those places, there was also the harlots that would tempt them to come into the temple and participate in still the pagan worship. Okay, so what he's saying is that even though it's lawful for you to go and buy this meat, even though it's lawful for, lawful for you as a Corinthian to participate in this worship, it's definitely not profitable for you. Okay, you guys follow that? All things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient. Okay? You want to put that in, in uh, our scope today. It might not be as grave or as, ooh, wow, that's a big deal, harlots and so forth. But we do understand there's a lot of things that are lawful for us to do, lawful for us to participate in, but is it profitable for us as a Christian? Okay? There are even things we know that are definitely not wrong that we can enjoy to an extent, but is it, at the end of the day, really that profitable for me spiritually? All right, you guys can think of the things, whether it be your media, your video games, what, you know, people you hang out with and such. And that's why I think it's important where we see at the end of the verse where he says, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And it's very easy for us to allow things that are not necessarily bad, that are lawful, that I can enjoy, to actually control a large portion of my life. All right, I'll give you guys an example. You could probably think of your own, but I understand this all too well. And Miss Christine, you know, she, she, she understands it all too well as, as well. But there are people that love sports and love football and love things like that. Or there's people that love 
media and like movies and certain movies they like to go see and there are people that will have, that have relationships and people they want to be around and they structure their entire life in order to enjoy those things or those people to the utmost of their ability to where to where they will neglect things that are should not be neglected like they'll skip meals for certain things or they'll stand in line in bad weather for so who knows how long or scream at the top of their lungs to the only, to their the detriment of their voice and so forth those are all examples of how you can very easily, without even thinking about it, be brought under the power of something that is completely lawful unto you. All right? But that's when it becomes a dangerous thing. That's when it becomes something that could be an idol in your life. So who's in control? That thing, that person, that event, or God? So a question to ask is, will this enslave me? Is this activity really profitable for my spiritual life? So well, another way to think of this, this all things are lawful to me, it's a false view of Christian freedom. All right, remember, you are set free from sin. You're not set free to sin, okay? Set free from sin, not set free to sin. Will this enslave me? Will this activity be profitable for my spiritual life? Somebody find for me Ephesians 5.18. Micaiah. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. But be filled with the Spirit. So who's in control? He gives the example there of don't be drunk with wine. That's a classic example of something that definitely puts you under the power of it if you, don't, uh, if you take part of it. Don't be filled with that. No, be filled rather with the Spirit. All right. Our next phrase we're going to look at is the meats for the belly and the belly for meats. And I kind of explained that a little bit about the temple worship and so forth but you can also understand this it's just like the the defense would be hey hey there's nothing wrong with buying it there's nothing wrong with going down there you got to eat the meats for the belly and the bellies for me if you're hungry you just got to satisfy that desire all right and that's very much a and i have hw if you want to know what that means that's a that's a humanistic worldview not homework humanistic worldview all right and the hum the humanistic worldview in society says that hey it's only natural to satisfy your desires, okay? And that goes across a whole spectrum of things. It's not just your appetite. Hey, it's only natural to satisfy your appetite. Just buy some meat. But he's going to talk about here later on about fornication, and there's a very philosophical, not philosophical, but there's this very much this worldview that's being pushed forward that, hey, one's sexual desire is simply an appetite that must be filled, all right? It's no different than eating a hamburger when you're hungry. So it doesn't matter if you get that from your spouse or somebody else. And you can see how that can lead to very dangerous outcomes. Or even when it comes to, you know, hey, I want to buy something. Or, hey, I just need more money. That's a desire that should naturally, you should be naturally left to satisfy. Okay? So let's think about that for a second. Okay? We just talked about not being brought under the power of any. If you allow yourself to be brought under the power of satisfying your appetite like i just want to eat all these great amazing things what could that lead to besides being yeah gluttony all right and the bible does talk about gluttony as a sin all right i know we're in a baptist church but it's often kind of joked about but the understanding guys is gluttony is a sin all right if you're eating in excess more so than you need to we lift it up as a trophy a lot of times, but you understand if it's detrimental to your health if you don't contain it and so forth. That's why God says, hey, don't allow this to be. If you're being brought under the power of satisfying your appetite, it leads to gluttony. If you're brought under the power of satisfying a, 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 a sensual urge, it leads to fornication. If you get brought underneath the power of wanting to satisfy your desire to obtain this and that, it leads to greed. Gluttony, fornication, greed. Yeah, it sounds natural that, hey, you have a desire, you want to satisfy it, but anytime you take that which God meant for good out of its ideal divine parameters that God has founded, that leads to flesh living. Okay? Makai, is it wrong to eat steak? No. No, praise the Lord, it's not. Okay? Is it wrong to eat, people do this, but like 10 pounds of steak in one sitting? Yeah, they're, it's called like contest, all right? 
It probably is, all right? And, and, and that's the understanding, okay? It's lawful to me, but it's not always expedient, especially if, it's, if I'm brought under the power of it, okay? God wants you, God har, har, you guys understand, God has hardwired every human being to want to experience the awe of something, right? Whether it be a delicious steak, whether it be, you know, your husband, your wife, whether it be, you know, enjoying a nice vacation because you can afford it, okay? But whenever those things are brought outside of God's ideal divine parameters, it becomes flesh living, okay? Intimacy outside of marriage, eating way too much, you know, being the love of money is the root of all. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Don't, if you're brought under, if you don't know who's in control, if you're brought under the power of anything beside the spirit of God, it's going to lead to flesh living, okay? Um, turn over to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. All right, we're going to read verse 1 through 4. Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4. All right, the Bible says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? All right, this is the false view of uh, Christian freedom saying like, oh, because you're saved. Hey, you're saved by the grace of God. You're, you can do whatever you want. It's like, so should we just continue sin that grace can abound? No, it says in verse 2, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin or set free to sin live, like, live any longer therein, be brought under the power of again? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Okay, who's in control? Are you yielding to flesh or to the spirit? You guys didn't catch it there. That's the illustration, obviously, of what happens when we baptize someone. Buried as Christ was buried, risen as Christ was risen from the dead, to walk in newness of life. Your, your old self, your old nature, like we talked in Sunday school class, it's crucified with Christ. You now live in newness of life. All right, our last point for this evening is who are you joined to? All right, remember, we talked about uh, the one body, the one spirit, okay? And Paul, what he's going to do here, he's going to use the picture of marriage, all right? And what is marriage described as? One one man and one woman. That's very, that's very good. All right, but we'll, we'll go uh, beyond that in a second here. But let's read till the end of chapter, verse 15 to verse 20. The Bible says, what then? Oh, I should probably go back to 1 Corinthians. All right, <laughs> verse 15 to verse 20. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ, what is the, the body of Christ, and make them the members of an harlot? Okay, we talked about this earlier. God forbid. Don't do that. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Well, hello. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, that ye are not your own, for, and here's verse 20 again, for you have bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are whose? God's. All right, so the believer's body is a member of Christ. We already talked about that. Your body belongs to him. How then can we join that same body, you know, with sin at the same time? Okay. Uh, he talks about, and we already talked about this, will I take that body and join it unto a harlot? No, of course not. Okay. Um, but he uses the phrase, he talks about one flesh, okay? And this is what I meant when he talks about using marriage as a picture of our union with Christ, okay? Somebody go find me Genesis chapter 2, verse 22. Jether. Oh, 24, my bad, my bad, my bad. He's like... Therefore shall man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. All right, so everyone look up here. Look up here real quick, all right? Marriage, as described in the Bible, is referred to as a one flesh relationship. And guys, I need you all to understand this. This is not simply referring to physical intimacy. No. 
This is referring to the all-encompassing intimate relationship that marriage entails. It's not just something that you give of yourself bodily, but it involves your whole personality. All right, guys, this is why it's so important why we harp on it and we tell you guys why it's so important to remain pure into marriage, to guard your heart with all diligence, to be careful who you just allow yourself to crush on and, and, and chase after and so forth because marriage and what many people give away outside of marriage involves so much more than just what happens with your body as we see at the end of this chapter he says hey fornication is not just committed outside of the body it's committed with the body and it affects more than just you so let's just go further with this illustration if he says that marriage is a one flesh relationship and if someone is unfaithful to their spouse and we see here in, in the book of corinthians talks about they join into a harlot or they commit adultery is what we refer to it as if they and their husband are one flesh and they commit adultery against their spouse, who do they bring into that adultery with them? Not physically, but what? Their spouse. Guys, because it has an irrevocable damage done to that relationship, because it's not just them, it also includes their spouse. Okay, and they can try to hide it as much as they want, but in the end, you reap what you sow. And that's very important to understand, is because spiritually, We've been referring to this already. If you are a child of God, you are of one body and one spirit with God. When you allow yourself to be brought under the power of any, when you allow yourself to be unfaithful to God, you're not doing that outside of God, okay? It's very easy for, especially Christians in America today, to think like, all right, I'm holding hands with God on Sunday, holding hands with God on, on Wednesday, and then the rest of the week, I'm just going to leave God at home, so to speak, at church. And I'm going to live how I want the rest of the week. Does that seem right, guys? And now usually when I just put it like that, it doesn't seem that big of a deal. But when you have the understanding that you are of a one flesh relationship with God, and I know you guys are just teenagers, but when you get hopefully one day, Lord willing, scary thought for some of you, but when you do meet that spouse one day in the future, you will better understand that the thought of even, even just the thought of being unfaithful to your spouse no, that's not even fathomable. Prayfully, that's something that all you guys will feel. But then flip that over to your spiritual life. How often do I allow myself to easily be unfaithful to God, to be, as he puts here, to be joined into a harlot? Now, the Corinthians, unfortunately, were quite doing that, not just spiritually, but also quite physically as well. And that's why Paul's coming down there, so to speak, to lay the hammer down on them. But he's giving this illustration for a purpose, okay? This is how... Just imagine, if it does such damage to a marriage relationship, it does great damage to your fellowship with God as well. See, marriage involves commitment, and so does our relationship with Christ. See, we are one spirit. I'm always missing these points. All right? We are one spirit with the Lord, and we must yield our bodies to him as living sacrifices. All right? and we talked about this many times. Romans 12, 1 and 2. So if we begin each day by surrendering to him, it will make a great difference deal of difference in what we do with our bodies during the day. I right? remember on Sunday we talked about man is a three-part being, spirit, soul, body. If you yield unto the spirit, it's going to dictate how your soul thinks and feels and eventually how your body behaves. But if you sever it right at the top and you're operating just in your flesh, that soul part of your mind, will, and emotions, you're going to have a whole different exercise that's going on with your body instead. God the Father created our bodies. God the Son redeemed them and made them part of his body and the spirit indwells our bodies and makes them the very temple of god the church of corinth had become a defiled church and god was writing them because something needed to be done that's the whole past two lessons the whole point of church discipline is because hey you guys are messing up and something needs to be done and the main point here is as one body with christ a temple okay are you defiling your body all right, that one relationship you have with Christ. Are you defiling the temple? He says, what? No, you're not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. What did Jesus do when he saw that there was defilement happening in his father's house, in his temple? Is that? No, no, no. He fashioned a cord, fashioned a whip. All right. Now, I don't believe he was actually whipping people. He was whipping the livestock to drive them out because 
when they see their livestock driving out, of course they're going to run out after that. When he flips the tables over, all the money's going everywhere. What's the money changers doing? They're running after their money and so forth. But he drove it out. Okay? You guys understand, if there's anything that you're allowing to bring you under the power of instead of under God, that's probably something you need to drive out. Not something that you just need to tolerate or be like, you know what? I'm not, at least I'm not doing it when I'm at home with God, so to speak. Okay? Main point is glorify God with your body. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all in, do all to the what? Glory. Glory of God. All right, very good.